Headlines this afternoon with the ITV Lunchtime News. Martha's Rule giving families a legal right to a second opinion in hospitals in England from April. It follows the campaign by the parents of 13-year-old Martha Mills who died from sepsis but wasn't sent to intensive care. The new rule will give patients more power to question medical decisions. Above anything, we obviously hope it will save lives um, and help change the culture uh, in hospitals. Also, there's lunchtime concerns over Britain's nuclear deterrent after a missile misfire. The Ministry of Defence says it's an anomaly. Labour seeks to avoid another rebellion as MPs prepare to vote on a Gaza ceasefire. The council's cutting back on street lighting to save money. Critics say it's a dim idea. And the retro suites making a comeback as the nation's favourites. TV Lunchtime News with Lucrezia Millerini. Good afternoon. Martha's Rule giving patients and families the legal right to seek an urgent second opinion should they be worried about the condition getting worse will be rolled out in hospitals in England from April. It follows the death of 13-year-old Martha Mills in 2021, who died after developing sepsis while she was in hospital. A coroner ruled she most likely would have survived had doctors at the time listened to concerns and acted sooner. Well, since then, Martha's parents have campaigned for change in the law to give families more say. So she'll carry on now on what this will mean for patients and for hospitals. Martha was just 13 when she died in hospital of sepsis. Doctors missed the signs, even after her parents warned them. Her condition was worsening. I feel horrifically guilty. I didn't know or understand how the system works. I put a lot of faith and trust in the doctors that were looking after Martha, even when I thought they were wrong. When I had friends or family members who went into hospital after, um, after Martha died, I said to them, if you ever feel like anything's going wrong, um, do what I didn't do and scream the war down. It's what led Maropi to campaign for a new Martha's Rule, a scheme now being rolled out to hospitals across England, giving families a new legal right to a second opinion if they believe their loved one's condition is deteriorating. If they get admitted to hospital, and they worry that something's going wrong at some point, and they don't feel that their voice is being listened to, they have somewhere to turn. Because that's, that's, we didn't have that when we were there. Martha's Rule gives patients and families access to a critical care team for a second opinion, any time, day or night. The urgent review would be carried out by a different group of senior medics if a family feels their concerns are being dismissed. Initially, at least, a hundred hospitals will bring in the new rule eventually extending to all acute hospitals subject to funding. Hello there. Here at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in Reading, they've been doing something similar since 2009. They call it call for concern. Initially, there were definitely teething problems. People were defensive. They were worried. Suddenly this team comes in and they felt like they were being questioned about their care. Well, actually, through time, you know, of us working of the critical care outreach team working with these wards, they've come to really, really value that call for concern service. The health secretary says Martha's rule will help to ensure doctors listen to families and don't miss vital warnings. Listening to Maropi and the um, effort she went to to raise the alarm, to voice her concerns, you know, she needed to be listened to and we want to make that easier for parents but other family members and, and friends. Martha's mum believes it'll help save lives and will mean her daughter's death was not entirely in vain. Sedgwick Carrier, ITV News. Well, health
correspondent Rebecca Barry joins us now. And Rebecca, this change in the law is what Martha's parents have campaigned tirelessly for. Yeah, on the face of it, it is a positive development. But of course, as you heard in that report, this has only come about because of one family's tragedy and their tireless campaigning. The family of 13-year-old Martha Mills felt that when they had concerns about her deteriorating condition before she died, they didn't know where to turn. There was no metaphorical emergency cord that they could pull. So this is all about a shift in the culture in hospitals, a shift in the hierarchy, so that acknowledging that doctors aren't always right and acknowledging that um, the important role, the critical role that patients' families pe play in patient care. At first, it's only being rolled out in about two thirds of hospitals across England. They'll get government funding for things like posters and leaflets so that they can publicize the scheme to patients. But for it to be rolled out across all hospitals, there'll obviously need to be more government money. Now, the health secretary insists that she is fully committed to doing that. The British Medical Association, which uh, represents doctors, has welcomed the scheme, but it says it's essential that the current workforce crisis is addressed if there's gonna be enough staff to deliver this. Rebecca, thank you. Next is lunchtime. Questions have been raised about the effectiveness of Britain's nuclear deterrent. It's after a test launch from a Royal Navy submarine misfired, crashing into the ocean off the coast of Florida. Our political correspondent Carl Dim is at the Ministry of Defence Forces. Lunchtime, Carl. This has been called an anomaly, but it's raised serious concerns. It's incredibly serious because anything that brings into question the effectiveness of Britain's nuclear deterrent undermines the entire point of having one in the first place. What happened was about three weeks ago, HMS Vanguard was ending uh, a long series of what were otherwise successful tests when it launched this uh, dummy missile. And to quote the Sun newspaper, which broke the story, it left the submarine, but it just went plop right next to them. Uh, according to a source, it's particularly embarrassing because the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps himself, was on the submarine uh, to watch it happen. Now, all morning, the Ministry of Defence and the rest of Whitehall have been going into overdrive to try and reassure people that uh, the nuclear deterrent still works because uh, it is incredibly important that it is known uh, that it does. But it's very difficult for them to do that because it's one of the most secretive uh, parts of the whole of the military. So a short while ago, Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, put out a statement saying an anomaly did occur, but was event-specific, and there are no implications for the reliability of the wider Trident, wider Trident missile systems and stockpiles. In addition to that, I understand this was not uh, human error, and it was specifically part of the test that was being carried out uh, in a way that the MOD say would not have been part of any launch that was carried out in real in the real world in anger in other words and that is why they insist that the trident nuclear missile system does still work okay Carl, the ministry of defense thank you that could be another awkward day for labor leaders keir starmer as mps debate calls for a ceasefire in gaza ahead of a vote later today labor has tabled an amendment to an smp motion demanding an immediate ceasefire. Our political reporter, Jasmine Cameron Chilishi, is at Westminster this lunchtime. And Jasmine, what can we expect to happen today? So as you say, both the government and Labour have tabled uh, these amendments to the SNP proposition. There was some fear among uh, Labour insiders uh, that their amendment wouldn't be selected and that they'd be forced to either abstain to vote with the SNP or vote with the government. It now sounds like uh, their amendment has been selected by the Speaker. Now, if we remember what happened last time when there was an SNP debate on this matter, it sparked this huge uh, divide within the Labour Party. We saw around 56 uh, Labour MPs rebel, around 10 shadow front benches resigned from their positions. Today, Labour's position has shifted slightly. They're calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, they're hoping that this will uh, gain the support of many of their uh, Labour MPs. Now, I spoke to uh, Shadow Minister Lisa Nandy this morning. She rejected suggestions uh, from the government that uh, this, this change of position was due to internal uh, party politics. She said uh, Labour simply responding to the changing situation on the ground. What's changed in recent months is that the humanitarian situation in Gaza has almost completely collapsed. You've got 1.4 million people, a 
effectively kettled into a small area in the south of Gaza near Rafah. They can't move forwards, they can't move backwards, and a ground invasion is now imminent. That's why our Five Eyes partners, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States have all shifted position in recent days. Now, it's important to note that what happens in today's debate won't really have any impact on the current uh, UK government's position, but it does shed light on how tricky this particular topic has been for the Labour Party. I've, I've been speaking to Labour MPs over the past few weeks and months who've been inundated with messages from activists, from uh, constituents concerned about uh, the Labour's, uh, Labour Party's position on this. And so all eyes will be on the debate chamber this afternoon to see how many, if any, uh, Labour MPs rebel and what could be another big test, Sir Keir Starmer. Jasmine, thank you. The government has imposed sanctions against six Russian prison bosses in charge of the Arctic penal colony where Alexei Navalny died. It makes Britain the first country to impose sanctions in response to the Russian opposition leader's death. The individual's assets will be frozen. They'll also be banned from travelling to the UK. Thousands of junior doctors across Wales have begun a three-day strike, their second round of action in a dispute over pay. The British Medical Association says salaries have dropped by more than a third over the past 15 years. The Welsh Government has offered a 5% rise. Katie Fenton was with doctors on the picket line this morning. Junior doctors have been making their voices heard from this very wet picket line outside the University Hospital of Wales since 7 o'clock this morning. The strength of feeling was clear across Wales when more than 97% of junior doctors voted in favour of industrial action. This is the start of a second three-day walkout after the same action was held in January and that saw 41% of outpatient appointments and 61% of operations cancelled across Wales, so undoubtedly a huge impact on uh, already record high waiting lists here. But the junior doctors I've spoken to this morning say they're prepared to do this for as long as it takes. There's a huge responsibility on junior doctors every single day, as, as there are for, for many other staff, of course. Uh, that was perfectly exemplified during the pandemic, you know, we've seen that come to the conversation again today. And to, to be shown such contempt by the government after making such sacrifices. And everyone's demanding more a lot quicker just because of the way the world's working. And uh, we want to provide that. But we see regularly that the patients aren't getting as good a care as we know we could give. Well, the Welsh Government isn't budging on what it's offered, which is a 5% pay rise. That is the lowest offer in the UK, but strikes are continuing to go ahead in England and are set to go ahead in Northern Ireland for the first time. It's only in Scotland where a settlement has been reached. But the Health Minister here says her hands are tied by the funding she gets from Westminster. The UK Government, though, insists that Wales has received a record level of funding. So it seems highly unlikely that talks will resume in time to stop these strikes, which are set to continue until 7 o'clock on Saturday morning. What is highly likely is that this is going to have another huge impact on patients. All right, Katie Fenton reporting there. Still to come this lunchtime. Is it getting dark on a street near you? The cash-strapped councils cutting back on lighting. Last we reveal the sweet treats. It's been named the nation's favourites. But first, hundreds of people in Plymouth have spent the night in temporary accommodation after what's thought to be an unexploded Second World War bomb was found in a garden. A major incident was declared and it's not clear when residents will be allowed home. Richard Lawrence is in the Keam area of the city where that discovery was made. And Richard, what's the latest? Well, as you can see, there is a huge police presence here, principally safeguarding people's properties. The device itself is about a metre long and 50 centimetres wide, so quite large for an unexploded device from World War II. It was found in the back garden of a house, which is several streets away, and this is just one edge of the cordon, so it is covering quite a large area of this part of the city. The police have also been here in large numbers because they've been helping people return to their homes who were away last night to pick up essential supplies and tend to pets or pick up medication while people are making arrangements for what could be the next 48 hours or more. We're worrying about what's going to happen today. We, uh, because we've got pets in the house, so we're worried.
worrying about them constantly. I had to get some medication for my partner, stuff for the dog, and just some overnight clothes, really, because we're going to have to stay somewhere after tonight, by the sounds of it. We've had a book of cottons down in Launceston, so I've got elderly, disabled people, um, so we basically get away from the area. Well, everybody appreciates that it's no one's fault, but they are frustrated by the lack of information that's come from the city council and other authorities. I've just spoken to the police who are keen to reassure residents that every effort is being made done to assess what needs to be done to this device, whether it will be safe enough to carry out a controlled explosion within this location. People are mindful of a similar incident that happened in Exeter a few years ago, where substantial damage was caused to neighbouring properties, but police say a lot of lessons have been learned from that incident, and they hope it can be resolved successfully within the next 48 hours. Richard in Plymouth, thank you. It's claimed that a top civil servant told the former chairman of the post office to hobble into the general election rather than rip off the band-aid in terms of the organisation's finances. A memo claimed Henry Stoughton was warned that now was not the time to deal with long-term issues. Labour leader Sakir Starmer has called for an investigation into whether or not the government have been seeking to delay payments to sub-postmasters affected by the Horizon scandal. And average petrol prices have risen by more than three pence per litre in three weeks, new analysis shows. It means it would cost almost £79 to fill up a family car. Some councils across England have laid out their plans to cut back on street lighting in what's being described as a desperate measure to save costs. Facing around £4 billion of cutbacks, dimming street lighting or cutting it off completely could save authorities millions. Well, safety campaigners say the move puts lives at risk. Our consumer editor Chris Choi is here now. So Chris, what's happening? Well, some of these lights will be switched down so they're less intense. Others will be switched off completely for, for certain hours. We've worked out that tens of thousands of lights are involved in these plans. Some of the proposals are already underway. There are trials, uh, some of them lasting many months. Now, last night, after dark, I went to Havering to sample some local opinions. Most of the area is filled with young people, and young people really need to be seen. Um, I know at one o'clock in the morning where I live, when the lights go out, you, you certainly wouldn't go out. <laughs> and if the lights are then darker, then... I feel like their safety is in jeopardy to an extent as well. Some people did understand the, the financial pressures that the council is under. Uh, as I say, these plans happening all around the country. Let me give you some examples. Uh, first of all, Havering there, where it's proposed that around 4,000 streetlights will be dimmed, saving about £50,000 a year. Across the whole of Leicestershire, uh, it started earlier this month with around 64,000 streetlights dimmed to 30% intensity from 8pm, helping to save £380,000 a year. There are some exceptions, I must say, within Leicestershire, but particularly town centres. Uh, and since December in Southampton, around 12,500 lights are now turned off in residential areas between 1 and 5.30am, saving about £150,000 a year. Well, Chris, we heard some of the concerns. What are the councils saying then? Well, first of all, uh, of course, they're very attracted by the sheer scale of savings. We worked out it would be well over a million pounds. And earlier today, I spoke to the leader of Havering Council. Well, like many, many councils across the country, the uh, demand and the cost for social care and housing has been escalating, particularly, obviously, in the last couple of years where we've had high inflation, and uh, the cost of living crisis, etc., and that's pushed up a lot of costs. And what councils are telling us is that they had public consultations, they did local risk assessments to try and make sure that nothing dangerous happens, and if things go wrong, they'll be monitoring the situation, and they could change policies in the future. Chris, thank you. Sad news now on the actor Ewan McIntosh, who played Keith in The Office, has died at the age of 50. He just ticked one of the boxes. Not at all, to some extent, very much so. Don't know. What would you tick? Ricky Gervais, who created the comedy uh, sitcom, was among those who paid tribute, referring to Macintosh as an absolute original. His manager said he died after suffering two years of ill health. Same, they're always the same. 
Now, when it comes to sweet treats, it turns out the old classics are still the nation's favourites. Jelly Babies have been named Britain's confectionery of choice, despite being around for more than 150 years. And apparently, it has a lot to do with wanting to be taken back to our childhoods, as Faye Barker reports. They've been around for generations, but are still getting taste buds tingling and mouths watering. Jelly Babies were invented 160 years ago, but have just been voted the nation's favourite sweet. These are in a wibbly wobbly thing of their own. One for each fruit pastille. Steady. Another retro favourite, fruit pastels, was second in a survey of 2,000 Brits. Show control, lovely boy. And another old favourite was wine gums, which ranked third. All you've got to do is chill. It seems it's the familiarity and nostalgia linked to these sweets that makes them still so popular today. Your memory is very much linked to taste and smells of things. Uh, it's, it's been proven that that's a big part of it, of your memory. So as soon as you bite into something, it takes you straight back to the first time you had it, whenever that was, when you were five or six or ten or whatever, straight back to your childhood and happy times, I think. The dummy will bounce in your head. Haribo's Tang Fastics are the most modern sweet to make the top ten, but it is the Jelly Baby that is mostly the winner. Absolutely love them. They're really nice. Uh, I feel though more people should try them. No. No. <laughs> I don't like this texture. It's uh, too crumbly on the outside, and then the inside is too tough and jelly <laughs> Half the output is still exported, but at last the sweets are in our shop. The days of rationing are thankfully long gone. And today, on average, we each chomp on 19 sweets a week. Faye Barker, ITV News. And if that wasn't enough of a treat, singer Beyonce has made history once again, this time as the first black woman to top the Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart. This ain't Texas, no holdin'. Um, Texas Hold'em was a surprise release during the Super Bowl. It rocketed to number one after just four days and has already been streamed more than 19 million times in the US. And that's it. Mary is back at 6.30. The news where you are is next. But from the lunchtime team, bye-bye.